Okay, so we are working on step seven, evaluating premises on the basis of sufficiency. And this is example number 10, which is our very, very large diagram. I'm going to put the canvas down over here. So we are going to need to evaluate a lot of premises for sufficiency. Now remember, sufficiency, like relevance, follows the structure of the diagram. So we need to look at the diagram to know which premises we're going to evaluate in what groups. We need to evaluate all the pieces of evidence for any one claim together. Okay, So we only are able to see a portion of this diagram because it is so large. We can't see all of it at one time. And so I'm going to go over to this edge and come all the way down. We're going to start at the bottom move our way up. Now, because we're just doing sufficiency, we're going to ignore relevance and acceptability, and sometimes it's easiest to do by just assuming that everything's acceptable and relevant, and just asking together, do the premises constitute sufficient evidence for the claim they're giving evidence for? Now, whoops, didn't mean to move that. So this is going to be tough because we're going to need to figure out which premises are doing which work. So I know it's 24, 25, and 26. Let's find out what they're giving evidence for. They're all giving evidence for 23. So are a lot of premises. So let's start and find all the premises that are giving evidence for 23, which is the claim that it is acceptable to boo sitting politicians at sporting events. And I see 28 gives evidence for 23. Sitting politicians should expect criticism. 30 gives evidence for 23. Other fans are free to cheer sitting politicians if they wish. And these three, 24, 25, and 26, those are all the premises that the author is using to try to convince me that it is acceptable to boo sitting politicians at sporting events. Okay, so let's see. They should expect criticism. Other fans are free to cheer sitting politicians if they wish. And they're even worse than professional athletes and so on and so forth. Okay, so all together are these claims enough? And I'm going to say they are not. None of these claims provide any evidence that booing sitting politicians meets any kind of ethical standard. The fact that politicians may expect booing doesn't speak to ethical concerns, i.e. whether one should boo or not. Neither does the fact that they choose to be in politics or that we boo other people such as professional athletes. Okay, so basically I'm saying if you're going to say it's acceptable to boo silly politicians, you have to give an ethical principle that tells me why. The mere fact that they're, they should expect it, they may be true, they may be relevant, but it's not enough to say that it is acceptable. Okay, so that's that. Let's go up here and ask some of these smaller sub-arguments, see whether those premises are sufficient. 27 and 29 are used to give evidence to the fact that they should expect criticism. And I'm going to say 27 and 29 are sufficient. Premise 29 describes a certain job in a certain way, and premise 27 claims that those jobs are only assumed voluntarily. If a certain job has a certain characteristic and someone chooses that job, then they ought to expect that characteristic which is what premise 28 claims. So those are sufficient. How about 31? Fans can exercise their freedom of speech to be cheer or boo, therefore other fans are free to cheer, and that I would say is sufficient. 
premise 31 indicates that fans have at least two options, which is enough evidence to show that one of those options is available to them, which is what premise 30 claims. So let's go up a little bit. Do this section. Let's do 38. The author has yelled at coaches, therefore the author can't critique anyone else for yelling at coaches. 38 giving evidence for 39. I'm going to say it's insufficient. The mere fact that someone has engaged in a behavior is not enough to establish that they are precluded from criticizing that behavior. Very similar, by the way, to the way we evaluated this premise for relevance, but it's a little different. It's just saying, okay, let's say that's acceptable, you've yelled, and let's say that you should take that into account when talking about whether people can or cannot critique, but I'm still saying that's not enough. The main justification for critiquing someone else's behavior is that that behavior is inappropriate that behavior is inappropriate and the critique may have a positive effect I'm just noticing that's two justifications the main justifications are, are that okay Good. Now, is 39 sufficient to 40? I need to think about this one. The author can't critique anyone else for yelling at coaches, therefore it's a matter of individual consciousness. Now, I would say it's insufficient. There may be many reasons why the author can't critique anyone else for this behavior. The fact that the author is incapable of doing so does not mean that all such behavior is up to the individual's choice. For example, I may be incapable of critiquing my boss's behavior because to do so would jeopardize my job, but that does not mean that my boss's behavior is merely up to her or his own choice. Individual conscience. Okay. Is 40 sufficient for 37? Now we're going to assume that 40 is true. If it's a matter of individual conscience, then it's acceptable. Hmm. Uh, insufficient. Not everything that is a matter of individual conscience is acceptable. Much of this rests on what we mean by it's a matter of individual conscience. And if if we mean that it's a matter of individual conscience that any way you come down with it is okay, then in fact this is sufficient. The relativism of that is bothering me, but um, it depends on what we mean by a matter of individual conscience. So let's try this. If the phrase a matter of individual conscience is intended to mean that any choice is okay as long as the person makes it, then yes, all choices are by definition acceptable. So, you know, I think what they mean by matter of individual conscience, it's almost as if what they mean is a matter of individual taste. Like, huh, you can do it, you can not do it, and if that's the case, you can do it, you can not do it, then yeah. Um, it's acceptable. Okay. Uh, let's go back down. I think there are 
some premises over here. We've done all of these. We're going to move right on over. And let's do this sub-argument here. Let's focus on this one right here, 22 and so on. Okay. 18, 19, and 20 all give evidence to 21. We should discipline them. Schools and leagues don't. If they're not disciplined, something will happen. We don't want thing to happen, therefore we should discipline and say it's sufficient. Premise 18 indicates that a particular responsibility is not being met. Premise 19 indicates that if that responsibility remains unmet, a certain situation will develop and premise 20 claims that fans do not want that situation to develop. These claims give enough evidence for premise 21 which states that fans should take on that particular responsibility, i.e. discipline, disciplining the athletes themselves in order to avoid that negative situation. Okay, now it looks like there's two pieces of evidence for 17, so we'll do 22 and 21. Home and away players are responsible for the booing, let's say they are, and we should discipline the athletes by booing them, therefore it's acceptable. Now, we have to take them together, and I would say these are sufficient because premise 21 by itself is sufficient. If it is the case that we should discipline the athletes, then by definition, that action is acceptable because it's always acceptable to fulfill a particular duty. I don't even have to look at 22 um, because 21 by itself is sufficient. Now I'm going to move the canvas up here. I know that means we can't see some of this, but gives us more space down here. Okay, let's go over here. Look at this sub-argument. 12, 14, and 11. Um, steroid use cheating. He should have used steroids. It was an honest expression. Therefore, they should have allowed. I'm going to say this is insufficient. These premises do not consider the harm that may or that may have accompanied the asterisk campaign. The argument needs to at least consider such harms in order to weigh them against the other factors mentioned in the premises. So I'm not so much in this one looking at the premises themselves as I'm finding something that they omit it. That's really important. So I can't decide whether Major League Baseball should have allowed the Asterix campaign without knowing what were the possible negative effects of that campaign. So those three together are insufficient because they don't address. It's what they don't do. Okay, let's look at this sub-argument, all the evidence for 16. And that is 9, 10, 15, 13 and 14. Is it acceptable to boo cheaters? It's not sportsmanlike. There's nothing worse. They should have allowed the Asterix campaign against Barry Bonds. Booing cheaters is a responsibility of fans and cheering cheaters in anathema sports. Are these together sufficient? I would say they are sufficient. Together, these premises articulate the importance of uh, integrity in sports and the responsibility that fans have to protect that integrity. Those are protecting something that is central to a certain institution. In this case, sports is always acceptable. 
therefore these premises are sufficient. So I'm saying as long as you indicate that it's a responsibility to do something that's important and that's central to sports, then you've already established its acceptability. Okay. Okay, now we're going to look at this part of the argument over here. Let's start with 4 and 5, giving evidence to 3. They've looked the other way, and professional athletes have turned into maladjusted narcissists. Is this sufficient evidence they have not been booed? No. Insufficient. Just because their coaches have turned a blind eye, and the athletes have become narcissists, does not mean they have not been booed. It is perfectly possible that they are narcissists who have nevertheless experienced a fair amount of booing, or that they have had coaches that have neglected to discipline them, but fans who have been willing to boo them. So even if that's true, it just doesn't show me that they've not been booed since they were children. Now, I'm going to do 5 again because 5 is also intending to give evidence for 6. Let's let's assume it's true that professional athletes turn into maladjusted narcissists and let's assume that's acceptable. And even it's some kind of evidence, it's relevant that they, booing them when they're young, have kept them from being maladjusted. Uh, still insufficient. The fact that athletes are narcissists does not provide any evidence as to whether a certain action, in this case booing, would have precluded that development. And you know what, I'm going to get a new iLogos window because that one's getting awfully full and I want to be able to see as much as possible. That down there and just do another one. Okay, so I've done that. Let's talk about seven. Is seven sufficient? People are willing to boo their opponent because of their bad behavior, therefore they should be willing to boo their own team or player because of bad behavior. Unless that's insufficient. Being a fan is necessarily about being partisan and need not be framed by an ethics of equality or parity. Being willing, therefore, being willing to boo one's opponent does not require one to be willing to boo one's own team. Now how about eight? Oh, and I think we discovered last time that we are missing an arrow here, so we actually want to look at three, six, and eight. Um, now, assuming these are all acceptable, if they should be encouraged, I'm going to say these are sufficient. Um, in fact, 3 and 6 would be sufficient to establish 2. Since being maladjusted creates an enormous amount of suffering for the individual and anyone who loves that individual. If a certain action would keep that person from becoming maladjusted, it is acceptable. Okay, now I think we've done all of the, oh no we haven't, we haven't. There's more to do over here. I believe we didn't do, oh yes we did, we did 22 and 21, so now we have to focus on this section. Let's do 46. 
scientific research has shown X, therefore X, and I would say scientific 46 is sufficient as long as the scientific research is competently done, it provides a good basis for accepting the resulting claim. Good. How about 45? Is it sufficient to establish 47? Uh, yes. Wanting to please another individual or group automatically gives that individual group a psychological advantage. Good. Now how about 47? Uh, there are lots of other premises that are giving evidence to 43, so we need to see what are the other ones. 47, or just one more actually, 47 and 44. And I would say this is insufficient. The fact that the crowd has the psychological advantage does not justify the crowd using that advantage in the form of booing. Merely having a capacity is not enough to justify using that capacity. And just because the officials come to expect being booed is not enough evidence to show that such booing is acceptable. There are plenty of examples of behavior that is often expected, such as shoving in a crowded subway car that is nonetheless not acceptable. Okay, so we've done this, we've done this. How about 42, giving evidence to 41? They expect to be booed, therefore it's acceptable. Again, insufficient. And I'm going to just copy the same logic. just because the broadcasters oh, it's not showing up. Good, good, good. So we've done all of that. Okay, then I sense that there are some over here that we haven't done. This sub-argument here Let's do 34. They put their face on franchises. Is that sufficient to show they have large egos? I'm going to say it's insufficient. While being willing to put one's face on a large and public institution may be one piece of evidence of a large ego. It is not quite enough to establish such a broad claim. I would want to know more about the individual's choices and psychological makeup before making such a judgment. Then 33, 35, and 36 are all premises that give evidence for the claim that it is acceptable to boo owners of teams. They've got large egos. They should be able to tolerate. Comes to getting booed. Let's say those are insufficient. That which is tolerable is not necessarily acceptable. For example, I might be able to tolerate the rudeness of people who talk on cell phones in public places, but such action is, such behavior is widely accept, widely interpreted, widely considered to be unacceptable. Good. Okay. 
So I think we've done all of that. I just want to check over here. We've done all of that. We've done all of that. Okay, I think we've done all the sub arguments. Now, we need to look at all of the claims that I'm going to move the canvas again, which is going to block a little bit of our sufficiency. We need to look at all the claims that are giving evidence for the conclusion. Booing poor conduct should be encouraged. It is acceptable to boo cheaters. Premise 16. It is acceptable, 41, to boo a current broadcaster. It is acceptable to boo officials. It is acceptable, 23, down here. Remember, we've got to follow all the arrows. It's acceptable to boo sitting politicians. And it's acceptable to boo coaches at sporting events. Oops, and I almost forgot. Up here, 32. Anyone else? Okay. So all of these claims are about booing different kinds of people that might be present at a sporting event. All together, are they sufficient to establish the conclusion that booing at sporting events is sometimes acceptable? We're ignoring for the fact, for the moment, right now, whether they are acceptable or relevant. I'd say they are, together, they are sufficient. These premises all speak to specific individuals or individuals who might engage in specific behavior that may well be present at sporting events. If these premises are acceptable, then it is certainly the case that it is sometimes acceptable to boo at sporting events, which is the claim of the conclusion. Okay, and that is step seven done on example number 10.